And God's people said, Amen. Have your Bibles, turn with me uh, to Colossians chapter 4. <clears throat> We're going to begin there in verse 10 and read down through the end of this chapter uh, and concluding uh, this epistle. And while you're turning, I do want to remind you that next Sunday, really Monday week, tomorrow week, is Veterans Day. And uh, next Sunday, we're going to be giving recognition to our veterans uh, here at uh, Pathway. A matter of fact, uh, the American flags will be displayed uh, out in front of the church, and I always love to see those. Uh, Brother John Paulton is very faithful about doing that for us, and sometimes I just want to tell him just to leave them, you know. <clears throat> but he can't do that, and I understand it. But uh, they sure are pretty whenever they're there. Uh, in Colossians uh, chapter 4, beginning with verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, that is, his nephew, touching whom ye receive commandments, that is, instructions, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers, speaking of those who are circumcised, that are working with him, unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Ephorus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, greet you. Salute the brethren which are at Laodicea, and Nephus, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you. Amen. The resume... Of the saints, we have broken this down into two parts, and to be honest with you, we may end up breaking it down into three parts, according to how far we get today. But uh, we looked, we've already looked at this last week, resume of the saints. I remember some years ago a uh, teacher friend of mine who was retired, graduate of Troy, and taught for many years up in the state of Illinois and retired and moved back to the state of Alabama. This is his home. He and I were talking one day, and he told me about a teacher, uh, another instructor in a school in which he, he was teaching uh, there in Illinois. He said that, that uh, on his resume he put down uh, that he had a, <coughs> excuse me, a master's degree. He also had it framed uh, on his wall uh, there within his room. Well, the school began to do some research. And whenever they did their research, they realized that what he claimed to have, he did not. He had falsified what he had put down on his resume. Listen to me very carefully. You may have a literal resume, a physical resume. Some people do. Some of us have to have them because they are requested. 
But regardless of whether you have a literal or a physical resume or not, all of us have a spiritual resume. Every one of us. But the only difference between the two is that instead of us putting down what's on our resume, God's putting it down. As He sees our lives and as He observes us, He's putting things down, certain things down, upon our resume. Well, last week we looked at two individuals who, who, and we looked at their resume. One was Tukikas, and the other one was Onesimus. And the Bible tells us that they were faithful messengers, they were faithful ministers, and they were faithful servants. Well, today I want us to note three other things uh, in relationship to your resume, the saints' resume. There's three things that I want us to notice here. Matter of fact, literally, there are three groups that I want us to look at. And so you look at them rather quickly with me, if you will. First of all, I want you to note, as the Apostle Paul begins to conclude this epistle, one of the first things that he, he uh, says and he shares with us, he shares with us those men who stayed. There were those who stayed. I want you to, to look at them with me. The Bible says in uh, verse 10, he mentions one. His name is Archetus, and uh, or Aristarchus, rather. And uh, the Bible tells us some things about him, not only here, but it tells us some things about him elsewhere. Uh, he stands out in Scripture probably more so than some of the others who are mentioned within the latter part of this epistle. Aristarchus, the Bible tells us, first of all, that he was a fellow soldier with the Apostle Paul. In the book of Acts, chapter 19, whenever Paul goes back to the city of Jerusalem, you remember the uproar that uh, took place there because of what some accused him of doing. They falsely accused him. There was a tremendous uproar. The Bible says in chapter 19 that Aristarchus, there he was. He was with Paul. He was along beside him, standing there as a soldier of Jesus Christ. He was in the midst of the heat. He was in the midst of the battle there with the apostle Paul. You could say of Aristarchus that he was a faithful soldier. But... I want you to note something else about him. Not only do we find that he was a uh, fellow so soldier, but he was also a fellow sailor. Because you turn over to the book of Acts, verse 27, you will find that whenever Paul is making his journey uh, from Jerusalem uh, and uh, uh, leaving out, going to Rome, that whenever he was placed on the ship, there was another one there with him, and his name was Aristarchus. He was there with him. He was a faithful follower. He was a fellow sailor. Now get this. As you know, as you study the Scripture, you know that, that during that voyage, that there was a hurricane that took place. And the Apostle Paul and all of those that were on that ship was in the midst of that storm. And there was an eventual shipwreck. And here is, here is Aristarchus. Listen, he's already, he's already been under the heat. He's already been in trouble. He's already found himself in difficulty. But yet he is still there. He's in the midst of a storm now. He had already been in the midst of the battle there in in Jerusalem, now he's in the midst of the storm with the Apostle Paul. He's a fellow sailor with him headed to Rome. But I want you to note something else about him. The Bible says here in our text that he is a fellow prisoner. In other words, not only did he take that trip with Paul to Rome, he was there in bonds with him. He was in chains with the Apostle Paul. Now listen, he could have got out of that. After all, Paul already knew what was going to take place whenever he got to the city of Jerusalem. 
Aristarchus, he already knew. He was aware. He sensed. He knew that that was going to happen to a large degree. He had a sense of knowledge of knowing he could have got out of it. But he did not. He was faithful. He was one who stayed. He stayed despite the fact that he, it required him to be a faithful soldier, despite the fact that it required him being uh, a dedicated sailor there upon that ship, and despite the fact that it brought him to the place of being a fellow say, uh, uh, prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ there with the Apostle Paul. Oh, what a saint. May God add to his number, amen? amen. After all, if, if he was looking for comfort, if he was looking for him a holiday in, he was sure looking in the wrong place, was he not? He was faithful. He was one who stayed despite difficulty and trouble. But then I want you to note another one. Not only does he mention Aristarchus here, but he also mentions Marcus. Now, Marcus is one that we know by Mark. The Scripture describes him as John Mark, or here it describes him as Marcus. Let me share with you some things about him, some things you probably already are aware of, is that this young believer, whenever the Apostle Paul started his missionary journeys, his adventures, uh, that uh, Barnabas... Uh, was, was going to be going with him as a companion, and they decided to take this young believer, this young man who was the nephew of Barnabas, with them. And the Bible tells us that on that journey, Marcus, for some reason, left them. He forsook them. Matter of fact, it, it became a, a matter of controversy between Paul and Barnabas. And so on the second missionary journey, because Barnabas wanted to take Marcus, and Paul didn't because he didn't have confidence in him at that time, that uh, uh, Barnabas took Marcus, and they went in one direction, and Paul took Silas and went in another direction. He was a young man. When early in his, in his uh, walk with the Lord, he failed. He was a, you know, he, he just left. I don't know why he left. Uh, maybe he was just, at that time, he had some immaturity issues. I, I really don't know the reason why he left, but he left. But yet, the Bible tells us that uh, he repented. He became sorrowful. He learned from that experience. Even though he became a miserable failure by leaving the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, he was willing to repent and knock the dust off of his feet and get up and go again. And he traveled with Barnabas. And we never find where he was ever unfaithful and undependable as he ministered with Barnabas. And matter of fact, we also find him writing one of the Gospels of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the very same Mark that did that. And so here, even though he failed, but yet you can consider him one of those who, whenever he failed, whenever he uh, did not uh, complete his mission, the Bible says he just got up and started again. Listen to me. It could be that you're here today and you look back on your life and you say, you know, I have made so many wrong decisions in my life. I have, made, I have gone the wrong direction many, many times. Can I tell you something? Listen, all you have to do is be willing to begin again, repent, become sorrowful, and, and, and uh, every day is a new beginning in Jesus Christ. You can begin again. I've got good news for you. Mark did. And uh, on his resume, it could be said, yes, he failed, but yet he came back and stayed. All of us, to some degree, can identify with Mark, amen, at some point in our lives. But then I want you to, to note someone else. The Bible speaks of another one. And uh, his name is, here the scripture refers to him as Jesus, who is called Justice. 
Now, all three of these that Paul first mentions are Jews uh, who have come to know Christ and are there with him, who have stood by him. And so he mentions Jesus, who is called Justice. Of course, in the Hebrew, it is the uh, word Joshua. But I want you to note that it says very little about him other than the fact that he was there as a companion of the Apostle Paul. And so I want you to note two things about him. First of all, first of all, he gave great service. And at the same time, he lived unannounced. In other words, he was one of these that uh, didn't have to have his name in the bulletin. He didn't have to have his name recognized. He didn't have to have all the attention. He didn't, have all, he didn't have to have recognition. He was just willing to serve. He didn't even need a pat on the back because he wasn't living for that. He was living, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all the Scripture says about him is, his name is Justice. And he was a fellow companion with the Apostle Paul. In other words, he was another one who stayed with the Apostle Paul. But then I want you to note quickly some others. There are some Gentiles that are mentioned that I want to recognize here. In verse 14, there is Luke. And uh, uh, whenever the Scripture mentions Luke, he is a physician. He was Paul's personal physician, and Luke was also a writer. Uh, not only did he travel with Paul, not only was he on the ship with Paul, uh, there along with Aristarchus, but uh, the Bible tells us that uh, there is one of the other Gospels that are written, inspired of God by the hand of Luke, who wrote it. And so the Scripture tells us that not only did he write the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. We have Acts today. We know what took place in those early journeys of the, of the disciples and how the Gospel spread by the writing of this physician, this doctor by the name of Luke. Well... Look at another one, verse 15. We have one by the name of Nippus. A Nippus, rather. And uh, the Bible tells us very little about him except, number one, he was a person of hospitality. You know the reason why I, why I know that? It's because the Bible says that the church was in his house. In other words, they had church at his house. Basically, that's what it's saying. They didn't have places of worship like we do today. They met in homes, and so he opened up his home to the, to, uh, for it to be used as a place of worship for the believers there in the area in which he was. And so the Scripture tells us about Nephthys, uh, that uh, he was a man of hospitality. Church was going on in his house. Can I ask you a question? Does church go on in your house? Do you have church? Folks, listen. As believers, we should be having church every day. Not just here. We should be having church every day in our house. I had church this morning. And, and uh, I, didn't have a, I didn't have a pianist. I did not have a choir director. But me and the Lord met together, folks. And any time you and the Lord meet together, that's church. Amen? And uh, so here, the Bible speaks of Nephthys. But then, I want you to note another one in verse 17, another Gentile. His name is Archippus. And uh, the Scripture tells us this about him. And possibly, he's a pastor. He may have been pastor of Laodicea. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but the Bible tells us here that uh, he was encouraged to take his ministry seriously. I don't know what was going on. I don't know why Paul said what he did. 
but uh, he was giving him, a, a sending him a word of encouragement. He says, listen, make sure that you, t you take your ministry very seriously. Well, these along with others are, uh, that are not mentioned were stayers. They had stickability. They were dependable, regardless of the heat that they received, regardless of the storms that they experienced. They were dependable. Let me ask you, what does it take for you to become unfaithful to the Lord? What does it take for you to walk away? What does it take for you to go into another direction? What does it take for you to come to the place to where you're not dependable? Does it take all of that much? What does it take? You know, sad to say, for many saints today, it just does not take much at all for them to, to become uh, or come to the place of being undependable, untrustworthy. It doesn't take much. It really doesn't. It's sad, but it's true, is it not? Whenever 20% does the work of 80%, and that's average in, the average in, in, in just about any church, folks, there's something wrong with those figures and those facts. But anyway, the Bible tells us here that these were those who stayed. I pray that it can be put on your resume, that it can be there by the, by the hand of God, written by His pen, that you, mentioning, calling you by name, putting down on your resume, that there's one thing about you, and that is that you've got stickability, that God can depend upon you, not only can he depend upon you, but your other fellow believers can put dependency upon you as well. <laughs> Folks, listen. One of the greatest qualities of any saint is dependability. It's not the ability to sing. It's not the ability to speak. It's the ability, the willingness to be dependable. But then I want you to note a second one here. Not only, not only do we find uh, uh, the ones who stayed, we also find here the ones who prayed. Look at them with me rather quickly. The Bible tells us in verse 12 uh, that uh, I said ones. I should have said one because it was a group of one. The Bible speaks of him in verse 12, Ephorus. And the scripture tells us this about him. First of all, it speaks of his citizenship. He says, speaking of him, he says, he is one of you. In other words, he's a citizen there of Colossae. Not only was he a citizen there in Colossae, but he was a member of the local congregation to whom Paul was writing. But then I want you to note his characterization. The Bible describes him, and Paul describes him here, as a servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was in bonds, he was bound, and he was bound by the mere fact of his own choice. He became a servant of Jesus Christ. Now listen, uh, very few times ever in history that, that anyone became uh, a servant by choice. By just literal choice. They were either forced into it or they were sold into it, one or the other. But the Bible tells us here that this man, he was a servant of Jesus Christ. That is, he chose. It was his own decision to come to the place of living under the bondage and within the boundaries of the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what it says about him. But I want you to note what else it says about him. I want to note his carrying in verse uh, 13, it, it tells us that uh, he was a person who had a great zeal for the church there, Colossae. But I want you to note the degree of his carrying, and we find that back in verse 12. The Bible says that he was always laboring fervently for you in prayers. And look at the depth 
of his prey. Nor does it speak of the degree of it. Always. In other words, he was constantly, uh, uh, continually remembering those saints there, Colossae, in prayer. But look at the depth of his praying. He did not pray for their arthritis to be removed. He didn't pray for their bursitis. He didn't pray for their toe ache. Did you notice that? He didn't do that. He did not pray for their runny nose. You know how he prayed? He prayed. He, wanted, he never prayed for those in the, spirit, in the physical realm. He was praying for them in the spiritual realm. He said that you might be perfectly firm. That is, that you might have stability. That whenever stress comes, whenever pressure from without comes, and it was coming, whenever persecution comes your way, that you will stand, that you will not run, that you will remain faithful. And then he adds to that, that knowing that he prayed that they would be perfectly firm, he prayed that they would be perfectly complete. That is, that he, he prayed for them that they would understand their completeness, just how complete they were in Jesus Christ. We can understand that today. Your resume, your resume, would it read, he or she, fill your name in the blank, is one who prays, But whenever it comes to adding how you pray, what would it say? You know, in the early church, the early church prayed for the spiritual needs more than they ever prayed for physical needs. They put their emphasis upon the spiritual. Today, we've got it flipped. We put so much emphasis upon the physical whenever we, especially today, brothers and sisters, in the body of Christ, we better start putting our emphasis upon the spiritual because if we don't have revival in this nation and revival don't start in the church uh, and a flame does not begin, if there's a, not a spark that starts, we're going to be in a mess. Matter of fact, we're already there. We need a revival, a turning back to God in this country. And we better start praying as the early church prayed and put the emphasis where it needs to be. What is the, of greatest importance? The greatest importance is not what takes place with me in the physical realm. The greatest importance is what takes place in my life in the spiritual realm. I got to hurry. But well, let's look at another one. The Bible tells us about those who stayed. It also speaks about the one who prayed. But then I want you to note one other, and that is the one who strayed. It mentions him three times in the Scripture. In the book of Philemon, verse 24, it speaks of him as a fellow laborer. His name is Demas in verse 14. He's mentioned there along with, with Luke. Here in this text, in verse 14, it says that Demas greet you. Speaking of him, he says, Beloved Luke and Demas greet you. He's mentioned there. But then, the last time that his name is mentioned, this is what the Apostle Paul says about Demas. In 2 Timothy 4.10, this is what it says. And folks, none of us, hopefully, will not have this upon our resume. Listen to what is said. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That's what said. John Mark had forsaken Paul and Barnabas, but later he was reclaimed. But nowhere in this book do we ever find where Demas is ever reclaimed. That he ever returns. He leaves because of his love of the present world. And there's no indication that he ever comes back. It's a terrible thing to have on your resume. Verse 
It's a sad, sad epitaph that is put at the bottom of your resume whenever your life concludes that it ends, that the last thing that can be said about you is that you have forsaken the Lord having loved this present world. I don't know about you. I don't want that on mine. All of us, as I've already said, has a spiritual resume. I don't know what is on yours. There's two of these that I hope will be on mine, and that is that I stayed. That regardless of the heat, regardless of the stress and pressures, regardless of what comes my way, regardless of the attacks, that I stayed. And not only that I stayed, but I prayed that I'll be known and God can place it in my resume that I was a prayer warrior for Jesus Christ. And I pray that it never be said that I strayed. And it could be here this morning. You could be here and maybe that latter part, that last one is you. You have strayed. You can be like John Mark. You can come back. Demas could have come back, but he never did. You've got a choice, either being a Mark or a Demas. I pray that you choose to be a Mark, that you will return, that you will leave your strain behind, and that you will come to the place of restoring your fellowship and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us stand.